Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this, the fourth in our series of free live webinars. By way of introduction, I'm Dr. Tom Cordell, and I'm one of the medical directors at the UK General Internal Medicine Conference. For those of you who haven't discovered UKGIM yet, the inaugural conference is scheduled the 2nd and 3rd of March 2021. Originally planned to take place at Excel London, the conference will now take place online and we're confident that the platform we're using will offer a fantastic conference experience for delegates. Presentations will be given live, delegates can ask speakers questions, and there are networking opportunities, including instant messaging facilities and one-on-one -on -one video chat. The conference is aimed at doctors and senior allied health professionals involved in the care of patients with general medical needs. Our team rec recognise that in our ageing multimorbid population, patients don't present with single organ system problems. And yet, over the last couple of decades, higher specialist training and post-CCT CPD has become very focused on subspecialty areas. As a result, dealing with problems outside our usual area of expertise, overnight or at weekends, on the acute take, can sometimes be daunting. UKGIM is designed to address that need. We have recruited a fantastic group of speakers who um, are from all areas of general internal medicine, and they are national and international experts in their fields. The conference will feature multiple concurrent lecture theatres over two days, offering 12 CPD points, and most speakers will repeat their presentation, meaning that delegates can construct their own bespoke programme of CPD. So, if you're enjoying our webinars, please do get your study leave booked and visit our website ukgim.com, where super early bird tickets are now on sale at the amazing price of £59 plus VAT. Moving on to this evening's webinar, if you have any questions, then please submit them in the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible, but please do forgive us if we can't cover everything. So I'm going to hand over this evening now to Dr. Adam Weldon, who is a consultant geriatrician and Parkinson's specialist at University Hospitals Dorset, who's going to present Beyond Levodopa on the acute take. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to pull up my slide now. Um, there we are. Can you all see the, the screen there? That looks good, Adam. Okay, and um, that's, that's okay? Lovely, thank you. Okay, and thank you very much to the audience for, for joining us this evening. It's great to have you all here. Um, as, as Tom said, I'm, I'm a consultant geriatrician uh, by trade. Um, we've, uh, we've recently um, merged, and so many of you may not have heard of Univers University Hospitals Dorset. It's, um, it's the merger of, of uh, Paul Hospital and Bournemouth Hospital, which is an exciting time. Um, as, a, as a geriatrician, I'm, um, I'm very interested in the management of patients who've got multiple comorbidities. Um, and so actually Parkinson's disease for me was really sort of the next stage on really um, from that because many patients with Parkinson's are frail and elderly and so have multiple comorbidities, not least their Parkinson's disease. And that can be quite a complex situation to manage. Um, and so I think as a geriatrician, um, that, that suits, the, uh, suits our training very well. We work very closely with, with our neurology colleagues and actually it's very helpful to be able to talk through patients with one another um, because of their complexity. I thought tonight I'll talk um, a little bit about Parkinson's. Um, many of you all have, uh, have done PACES and, and uh, MRCP and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to go through all of the, you know, the very basic things, but I thought I would just touch on some of those and then move on to some of the medications, talk about some of the common pitfalls in um, uh, on the acute medical take, talk about things like nil by mouth and how we can deal with that, and then move on to um, something which is quite close to my heart, which is um, to do with the management of trauma in elderly patients, particularly patients who have got Parkinson's disease, and, and I'll come on to that a little bit later in the presentation. As you know, um, Parkinson's disease is a very common neuro neurodegenerative condition. And in 2015, it was thought that over 6 million people were affected uh, by it. It wouldn't be a, a talk on Parkinson's if we didn't mention Dr. James Parkinson, who, who wrote um, an essay on the shaking palsy, um, which is a, it's a very nice, uh, a nice little book uh, with, some, with some, lovely, um, some lovely pictures in it, and things, which absolutely describes a person with Parkinson's disease, what we would, would recognise as someone with Parkinson's disease when they, when they walk into the, the 
in a crib. As you know, Parkinson's disease is, is a condition which tends to affect um, older people. Usual onset is 60 and over. The symptoms often emerge really very slowly um, and, uh, and I think are often there for a bit more time than perhaps when we first meet people with a possible diagnosis of Parkinson's. Actually, when you delve back in the history, it's not uncommon that they've got people have mentioned features, which may have been there for a couple of years really before anything clinically recognizable as the condition was, um, was, was present. And thankfully, often the symptoms emerge gradually and, and quite slowly in a, in a some, you know, often predictable way. People, when I see them, I tend to see patients who are more elderly um, and perhaps have, have multiple other problems. And, and actually often people will say, oh, I'm just slowing down. It's my age, doctor. I just, everything's just a bit slower. And I think actually it is, it can be masked in that way. People feeling that they've just slowed down, that this is a, a normal aging process, that the osteoarthritis in their hands is causing the stiffness and that they can't do the things that they, they were previously able to do. And so actually it's, it's not uncommon that, that Parkinson's can be referred at, you know, quite a, a later stage than perhaps you would, um, you would find in someone who, who was younger with the, with the condition. They don't have the same comorbidities. In terms of diagnosis, well, I'll, I'll just touch on this. The, the, the absolute cardinal feature is, is bradykinesia. So a general feeling of slowing up, all of the movements slowing down. When you examine people, you find rigidity. And in idiopathic Parkinson's, primary Parkinson's, that's usually in the upper limbs. In vascular Parkinson's, you may well find bradykinesia and rigidity more marked in, in the lower limbs. Tremor, of course, is, is, a, is a feature that five to six hertz, um, uh, what they call pill rolling tremor, it's classically described as. Um, they're um, at rest, um, not there on intention, so not an intention tremor. Tremor itself is there to a greater or lesser degree. Some people have it as the present presenting problem. Some people really don't have, have a tremor at all. If you probe people directly, people will often describe freezing episodes. So a feeling as though, particularly when they're walking through the threshold of a door, walking over a change in, um, in carpet texture. So perhaps going from a vinyl floor onto a, onto a carpeted floor, this feeling that they can't quite lift their feet. They can't get the feet to do what they want. And that, that's what we call freezing. And that, I find actually asking that, that point specifically, do you feel that you can't pick your feet up when you're going through, your, through a threshold of a door? Really, really helpful to, to, to help with the diagnosis. A very common, but I think sometimes unrecognized um, problem with Parkinson's or presenting complaint with Parkinson's is, is actually muscle cramps or dystonias. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, on the next slide. Idiopathic Parkinson's is, is is, is asymmetrical when, when, when it's first diagnosed. It, there's always either uh, more prominent features on the left side or, or the right hand side at, at presentation. And, I, and again, that can be a very helpful um, finding. In terms of dystonias, well, um, this, is, this is something which people will actually quite often describe, um, but perhaps has been unrecognized as, as a problem with the Parkinson's. Um, it, dystonias nearly always affect the, the side of the body which is most affected by the bradykinesia and the rigidity and, 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 those, and that side of things. But people will often describe in their, in their legs and feet, um, perhaps spasms, perhaps noticing that their, their toes are curling up. Um, sometimes people mention that their big toe tends to extend, um, so either go out or go up. People can, can talk about um, uh, head and neck dystonias, so slightly unusual postures with their head and neck, sometimes a feeling as though they almost got a, like a coat hanger behind their shoulder blades. Um, the hands can go, can, can go into a, a spasm, um, and sometimes people can, can actually um, can talk about you know, blepharospasm, so um, contractions of, of uh, the eyelids, which, which look like more rapid uh, blinking. So there can be features there which are to do with the Parkinson's, which can sometimes be diagnosed as, oh, you've got, you've got chronic back pain. Um, you know, it, it's not uncommon that people say, oh, I have a terrible night, my, my pain at night is, is terrible. And actually that could be the herald of, of the Parkinson's disease. So it's always just worth thinking about those things, particularly if on the take you find people that, uh, you see people that, that have 
other features suggestive of, of, of Parkinsonism. There's a lot of non-motor symptoms, and these are often not uh, mentioned. And, and actually, I think it's really important that we try and ask people directly about these, um, because actually sometimes the non-motor symptoms are the problem which people are most concerned about. So I think as doctors, we're often more worried about the, the gait, how they're able to, to move the arms and legs. But actually, people will often come to me and say, I just feel so tired, doctor. People will often describe pain, and that can be from, from these dystonias. People will often have problems with low blood pressure. And I'll, I'll come on to that a little bit more when we talk about medications. Restless legs is a, is, is a very common finding. So a feeling on a night that, um, that you just need to move the legs, that you can't quite sit still and, and need to get up and, and, try and try and walk it off. And people can come in really exhausted from, uh, from under-treated Parkinson's, um, just you know, from the restless legs. And that's something that is always helpful to ask about. Sleep is, or is a, definite, um, a definite problem for a lot of people with Parkinson's, and that's for a number of reasons. It can be from restless legs. Um, it can be that people with Parkinson's where they're not able to, to move as well at night, particularly because a lot of the treatments are given in the day and may well have worn out by the time the evening comes. So people aren't able to roll over in bed. And actually, it's very uncomfortable lying in one position. We all we see this every day where people are put on pressure relieving mattresses because you start to get pressure sores and that kind of thing. Well, people with Parkinson's will often have to lie in one position overnight, and that, and that can be very uncomfortable and keep people awake. Unfortunately, people can often have nightmares and are much more prone to hallucinations, either because of the condition itself um, or, some, or more often because of the medications. And so for that reason, we try and keep the medications away from nighttime. Um, so really try and make the last dose of the medications no later than sort of seven or eight o'clock. Now, you'll often see people who are on um, modified release preparations. So um, things like half Cinemet CR, Madapar CR, things like that to try and get people through the night. And that's really in people who have had problems with things like restless legs, with difficulties turning over at, uh, in bed, people that are really having difficulties at night, people who perhaps have to get up to go to the toilet um, because of prosthetism, for example, um, who just need to be a little bit more on. They're able to move um, overnight. And so that's when we tend to use those, those longer, um, those prolonged release medications for the night time. But the ideal situation is that people don't um, have those medications because it can cause problems with nightmares and hallucinations and very vivid dreams. You often hear people talk about the REM sleep disorder, and that's, that's something I, I always ask, um, ask the patients and also their partners. So people will often describe um, enacting dreams and, and partners will, will often say, oh, you know, the number of times I've been hit when, you know, he was going for a walk or, you know, and, and actually that's, that's where the, the normal inhibition of, of your sleep patterns is, 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 is not there. And so people actually enact the dream that they're having at the time. It can be very disruptive. And so people with Parkinson's can actually sometimes be really very tired because, because of the condition, because their muscles are working differently and they're often engaged when normally we would be at rest, but also because people are not able to, to sleep. There's a condition called excessive daytime somnolence, and that can be because of the Parkinson's, it can be because of, of the medications themselves, where people are just drowsy through the day. And, and you, you have to make an assessment, a judgment about whether or not you feel that that's medication related or not enough medication. Other things people describe. So hypohydrosis, so people not sweating. And that's, that can, it's often to do with the medications that we use, so some of the anticholinergic medications. The more medicine that, um, the more medicine that I do, the more I realize that medications I didn't realize had a large uh, cholinergic burden actually start to cause a lot of side effects. And so particularly when, I've, um, when I'm looking at patients who are, who are having falls with patients with Parkinson's, the more medications I can stop, to take away that cholinergic bur burden, the better people are. And so it's always worth just having a think about what medications they are. Are they it's not just the medications for the Parkinson's, it's the medications for all of the other comorbidities. And the more we can stop, the better generally people will feel. 
people sometimes talk about excessive sweating and this is this can be because of um, poor autonomic function but it can also be a wearing off effect from the medication so we give a medication that lasts four or five hours and actually at the time of wearing off people start to sweat at that point and it can be a sign that people need their their dose interval adjusting or the actual dose of the medication adjusting Swallowing difficulties are very common and always worth asking about if people feel that food is sticking in their throat, food going the wrong way. And of course, cyloria or, or drooling. Um, I actually find that quite a helpful thing to ask about when people are first referred to the clinic, so when they haven't got a formal diagnosis, people often describe some drooling from, what, from one corner or the other of their mouth. Thought I'd talk a bit about that because it's such a prominent feature with Parkinson's. Um, Drooling is really caused by a reduction in the frequency of swallowing. So it's not that you're making more saliva, just like other muscle groups, other, other functions in the body slow down, so does the swallow. And actually, just as people blink less, people swallow less when, when they have Parkinson's disease. Um, another thing which, which of course will cause um, uh, drooling, particularly if you're not swallowing, is if you're walking with a stooped posture, gravity kicks in and, and, and saliva will tend to, tend to want to come out of one corner or the other of the mouth. There are things which can be done to help with this and, and of course optimizing the medication, so starting treatment, adjusting the medications we have available can be very helpful. But also, particularly in, in more severe cases, having physiotherapy, occupational therapy assess, sometimes it is about positioning of the person. So that's positioning people when they when they wake up in the morning to, to a more upright posture, making sure the head position is appropriate, using things like tilting, tilting chairs to help the head position can be really helpful. But also things like sugar-free chewing gum, so that people are stimulated to swallow more. Sucking on um, ideally um, non-sugary sweets. Actually um, suggesting people sip water regularly as, as people sit watching TV, have a have, have regular sips of water can be really helpful. And there's also a swallowing uh, prompt app on Parkinson's UK, which, which sort of sends a, a message to, to sort of remind people to swallow. Um, I've, I've uh, suggested that on a couple of occasions and um, partners have always come back and said that they swallow at the same time when, when the app goes off. Um, dental health is always worth ha having a think about because People have difficulty swallowing. Um, there's often difficulty with controlling dentures. So where pe people, particularly frailer and older people, often have not perfectly fitting dentures. Um, but also when, when you have a slightly stooped posture, much more likely that the dentures will fall out and not, not as quick to be able to correct that. Of course, if you're generally a little bit slower, it's much harder to clean your teeth. And so dental health can be affected. Dry mouth is a, is a very common problem. And again, that's usually a side effect of the medication, so that, that cholinergic effect. And all of this together means that people with Parkinson's often have higher rates of tooth decay um, and, and have, can have really quite significant problems with, with their dentition. And again, what can be helpful is um, advising frequent sips of water. Saliva is a great antibacterial and it is, you know, it's a good thing to, uh, to have there to help with the dentition. Um, <clears throat> again, chewing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, chewing uh, non-sugar non um, gum, advising people to stop smoking, which dries them out, and artificial saliva can be, can be useful in terms of symptom control so people don't feel like they have a dry mouth. I'm only going to touch on memory briefly because I think um, this is a subject in its, in its own right, so um, Parkinson's related dementias. Lewy body dementia, of course, which is which is a, uh, a condition in, in its own right, presents slightly differently. But people with Parkinson's, particularly particularly as the condition progresses, will often have some some memory impairment. Anxiety is a particularly prominent feature, particularly with people who have got slightly more advanced Parkinson's. So pe people with Parkinson's disease have, have lived with the condition often for some years. There are multiple medications. They're very aware of their, um, uh, their, their health. They're very aware that um, that the condition is one which is gonna progress. And of course that promotes a huge amount of anxiety. Uh, and it's very common that um, the people will describe um, having, having panic attacks essentially. Depression, similarly, 
people who know that they have a, a chronic degenerative neurological condition um, who feel that they're losing their capabilities as the years go on. So not able to walk as far, not able to wash and dress and stuff, not able to do the things they always enjoyed. Um, depression is, is a, a very common finding. And of course, hallucinations and delusions uh, are something which um, I, I ask about at, at every consultation. I thought I'd talk a little bit more about those because they're, they're so common. So hallucinations, as you know, is when you see or hear or feel something that's not really there. And a delusion is, is an unusual thought, so a fixed false belief. It tends to occur um, when we're talking about idiopathic or primary Parkinson's, tends to occur later on in, in, in the Parkinson's condition. So it, it's unusual that people would present with, with hallucinations. And certainly if people had hallucinations as a very early feature prior to being on medications, I would, I would be considering other diagnoses. Things like Lewy, Lewy body dementia um, would, be more, would be much higher on, on my list of differentials. But hallucinations are very common in Parkinson's disease. Um, they, they often at night, they can be in the daytime. Um, very rarely do they seem to be something which causes the person concern or distress. Um, people will say, oh yes, when I look at the wallpaper, I often see a face. Um, but they know, they know that that's not real. People will very commonly describe seeing cats or dogs in the room with them or walking out from behind the curtain occasionally hearing children playing, that, that sort of thing, but not things which are frightening to them very often. People very quickly learn to adapt. Um, it's, it can be because of the Parkinson's, the underlying condition, but is also often driven by the medications. And so particularly if we're thinking about a vascular type Parkinson's, so that's a, a movement disorder, perhaps related to lots of small vessel ischemia, um, often with uh, vascular dementia. I think they have to be very cautious about the introduction of medications and how we titrate the medications because actually there's two problems. One is, one is the, the dementia itself and the other is the, the movement disorder which, 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 um, which is associated with that. And the medications are often not as effective and so you really don't want to be introducing significant problems with things like hallucinations actually driving the hallucinations by giving big doses of medications but again that's that's another um, that's another topic so in terms of some of my top tips for helping with the diagnosis of, of, of um, parkinson's as i mentioned try try not to think it's just natural that people are slowing up and i think if people are describing that they feel slower to me i start to think well perhaps this could be an underlying parkinson's condition Asking about a sense of smell is really helpful. Um, people will often lose their sense of smell, some years predating the, the motor symptoms. Freezing episodes, very useful to know about. Ask about constipation. People are often constipated with Parkinson's disease. People often have small handwriting or micrographia, drooling is a feature, and falls. And I'm gonna talk a bit about more uh, falls um, shortly. I thought I'd talk in general about some of the medications and some of the pitfalls we can have with, with the medications. So um, dopamine agonists are one of the big groups of medications that we use. Um, and I thought I would just write a few of the, a few of the brand names that are very common. So Pramipexil has got many brand names. So Mirapixin, Mirapixin Prolonged Release, Pexus, Park lots of names and so it's very easy if you're not used to using these medications regularly to become a little bit muddled about what the actual medication is and I would encourage you to spend quite a bit of time when someone comes in on, on the medical on call just being sure that you have the preparation right and that you know the timings of the medication it's very very easy to to, to prescribe that incorrectly. Ropinirole is another another dopamine agonist that's very common um, and uh, and retigotine, I'm sure sure you will use for people that are nil by mouth, but so uh, new probe and um, skin patches, and apomorphine. So so apomorphine is a, a non-selective dopamine agonist. Um, so it's, it, it works on D1 and D2 receptors. It works very quickly. So it's given as a subcutaneous injection. Um, starts to work within five to ten minutes. So much quicker than than the traditional treatments. It can be used when there's sudden fluctuations with dyskinesias. If people have got sudden off periods, they can, people can use that to try and bridge the gap of the off periods. So that's something that, that you may well see, see on the medical on call. It can be given as just individual injections. 
can often be given as, as, a, as a continuous infusion pump. With a dopamine agonist, there, there's a lot of side effects often, particularly in the frailer and older people. So people can present with drowsiness, um, people will often, can fall asleep just, just um, at the drop of a hat. It's always important to mention, particularly if you're going to prescribe these medications, some of the impulse and, and compulsive behaviours. So people can become shopaholics or binge eaters or compulsive gamblers when you start the medications or if you increase the dose of the medication. I think the main thing that I see, there's really two complications that I often see. One is that the, the dopamine agonists are beginning to drive hallucinations and delusions. So this on the medical on call is often the patient who has perhaps been on it for some years, but has come in delirious, has come in with hallucinations, which have been there you know, in the background for a little while, but now they're much worse. And actually, I think it's always worth thinking, is this the side effect of the medication that we're using? Postural hypotension is very common. And uh, I'm gonna come on to a, a case study a little bit later regarding that. I'll talk a little bit about levodopa. Levodopa is really is the mainstay of treatment. So the, the principal problem is that we don't have enough dopamine. And so levodopa is just giving back that dopamine. And there's two principal treatments. One's Madapar and one's Cinemet. And they're the two that, that you, you'll very, very often see. That, that is the real mainstay. Some people come in on a medication called Stilevo, and that's, that's co-carol dopa, so Cinemet with Entacapone. It's, it's a combined drug. Um, to try and try and bridge, uh, to, to lengthen the effect of, of the cinematic. And I'll talk a bit about that again shortly. And then there's there's controlled release versions. So people on a night time in particular may come in on Madapar CR or half cinemat CR to try and get people through the night so that people can turn and that sort of thing. The principal problems with levodopa are, well, over time, they're a wearing off effect. So whereas someone may have been started on a really simple regime, so levodopa, so Madapar, 62.5 milligrams, three times a day. And that will, that will help for some time. Then you'll need to increase the dose, 125 milligrams TDS, have to go up to QDS. But as time goes on, they will start to be wearing off. So people not quite getting to their next dose before they start to get the, the off feeling of Parkinson's. And that, that, that becomes more common as the condition progresses. Particularly at higher doses of levodopa, um, people can develop dyskinesia, so movements which they're not able to control. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's, it's not something I've seen a lot recently. I used to see it a, a lot more, but actually it's the, the bigger doses of levodopa that tend to drive that. And again, levodopa can induce impulsive and compulsive behaviors, so gambling, that sort of thing. When you first start the medication, um, or if you change the dose of the medication, it's always uh, helpful to tell patients that a common side effect is nausea at the time of, of dose adjustment. And so actually moving it to the meal times um, is, is really helpful with that. But also people can develop hypotension or postural hypotension. And I always warn people when we first change the dose to just be sort of very, very royal in their movement. So take things nice and slowly for a little while um, to you know, stand slowly, just let them find their equilibrium so they don't, they don't collapse with postural hypotension. I think it's, it's just helpful to warn people about that. I'll just touch on some of the other medications we use. So there's, there's the MAOB inhibitors. And what these is, they actually stop the breakdown of, of dopamine. They take a bit of time to work. They'll often take two to three, work, uh, two to three weeks to have their effect, whereas things like levodopa are a bit faster than that. They often have a wearing off time as well. So if you stop them, there's not going to be an immediate benefit, often two to three weeks. The two which are commonly used, so resagiline and selegiline. And what they do is, so as I mentioned, levodopa can wear off before the next dose. They will just extend the action by stopping the breakdown of, of the dopamine. And so you can sort of bridge that gap and get people to the next dose by the introduction of these medications. They can be used in early disease by themselves, but more commonly levodopa is used now. Um, I tend to use them to stop end of dose fluctuation, stop the wearing off of levodopa. You sometimes need to reduce the dose. When you, if you introduce these medications, you need to sometimes reduce the dose of the levodopa because actually it, it, its effect is, is, is um, higher. You know, the overall um, uh, pharma, pharmacological effect is higher. So you sometimes need to drop the dose of the, the levodopa 
um, if he introduces medications. And again, a common problem is postural hypotension, um, nausea, constipation, that sort of thing. Always worth warning people about. The other common medications that you'll see are, are COMT inhibitors. So in tacopone used very commonly, tends to be used at the time of the dose of the, of the Madapar or Cinemet. And again, that's designed to, um, to, to lengthen the effect of, of the dopamine, the levodopa. So as I mentioned earlier, and tacopone is joined into uh, with, with co-carol dopa to, the, to be the levo, so that's a common medication that we see. There's a new, a new uh, COMPT inhibitor around called apicopone, um, and that's, that's got some advantages. So it works in a very similar way to entacopone, but actually it has an effect which lasts for very much longer, and so it can be a once-daily medication. And as you can imagine, people with Parkinson's, particularly people that have lived with Parkinson's for some years, will often be on multiple medications. So anything which is once a day is a great help because having to take, having to add in another three or four tablets a day is really difficult for people to remember to take, to be able to take all of the side effects that come with multiple medications. But again, both the, the COMPT inhibitors are used to the length of the duration of levodopa. And then you've probably all heard of um, amantadine and that's principally used to try and reduce dyskinesia. So people that are having these unusual movements often because of the levodopa. And again, there, there can be side effects. In terms of the medical admissions, there, there are some really very, very common errors that happen at the time of admission. And they're often um, very easy to understand. You know, in the middle of the night, uh, where we don't often have access to all of the things that we'd like to have access to. Um, but very commonly, um, people are prescribed the wrong medication, the wrong type of uh, medication, so not given a, a prolonged release medication, for example, when, when they should be, so given you know, the faster acting levodopa at night, that sort of thing. So wrong times, wrong preparations. The dosing of the medication can actually be very difficult to work out. Um, and very often people are either prescribed too much of a medication for that particular time of day or too little medication. I'm sure we all recognize that the drug rounds essentially happen four times a day, but unfortunately the regimes of people with Parkinson's don't match on to drug round times very often. And so people very commonly get their medications either too soon or too late. And that, that comes with problems. I think it's really important to try and empower people, particularly people who, who, who still have capacity or are not delirious, to, to have their medications as they would at home, have their, take their own medications and just let the nurses know that that's, that's what they've done. Something which I see very commonly is, is are people that are having, gonna have a surgical procedure. Um, I would suggest that people who are made nil by mouth for a surgical procedure should still take their Parkinson's medications. It, it's a, it would be a terrible feeling for them to, to be off at the time of going down to theater or when they wake up and also more difficult for, for the anesthetist as well. So, you know, a, a small tablet or two the poor theatre is not, not making them not nil, nil by mouth. So my, my practice is to, is to suggest usually carrying on the medication if it's, you know, a, a couple of tablets. Um, often on the medical on call where someone's actually quite sick, so coming with an intercurrent illness, people will be unwell, unsafe, drowsy. So they, they, people often develop an unsafe swallow. But it's, we can't just make people nil by mouth with Parkinson's disease. We have to have an approach to that. The problem with just stopping the medications, well, the person in front of you gets worse. They, they, they can't move, the, the swallow deteriorates, um, everything begins to deteriorate. Actually makes the swallowing problems more difficult. We're more likely to precipitate problems like aspiration pneumonia. If people are trying to get up, they're much more likely to fall if they're not on their medications. And actually, just like any drug, drug withdrawal, we can worsen a delirium. So, there's a combination of problems, particularly on admission, where people are prescribed the wrong medication or made nil by mouth, and actually we worsen the delirium for them. And we know that delirium is associated with more mortality, morbidity, and, and worsening lengths of stay, and all of those things that come with delirium. Um, in the most severe cases, if we acutely withdraw some of the medications, people can develop a Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia syndrome, which is, think of it like the neuro, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. People can become very, very poorly by just acutely withdrawing the medication. 
So, so I think when, when we're on call, it's really important just to just to take a pause and to really try try and get the, the medications as close to right as possible. Um, I, I often suggest using people's own their own drug supply that often have brought them in if, if you know because it might not be on the ward overnight that sort of thing. Um, if there are swallowing problems, then we need to get an urgent salt opinion. So we need someone who can who can come and guide that that uh, guide us in terms of being able to eat and drink. If it's felt that the person really can't swallow safely, then the next option is to think about a nasogastric tube, and, and that's something to think about really straight away, day one on admission, because you want you want to get, get these medications where they need to be, otherwise the situation starts to get worse. If for whatever reason we can't do a nasogastric tube, well, a reticotine patch is often very helpful, so that's a dopamine agonist. As I mentioned, it can actually worsen things like hallucinations and delirium, so we have to be slightly cautious with it. Um, and there's a really excellent online calculator. So if you go to the UK Parkinson's um, website, uh, Parkinson's UK website, there's a really good online calculator to help you work out what the appropriate dose of that is. There are some medications which you can emit, so, uh, so things like entacopones, allegedly, and if, you, if people miss a few, few doses of those, they're not going to run into really significant problems straight away. So my top tips in terms of reticotine patches is don't go more than sort of eight milligrams in 24 hours in older and frail patients straight away. It's worth starting the patch at the lowest dose you feel you can and then titrating it up so that we don't, we don't induce deliriums and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the maximum dose of reticotine is 16 milligrams in 24 hours. So in terms of delirium, that's a very common thing, um, particularly in, in more frail and elderly patients, um, uh, who present to the take. And so, of course, um, people who, with Parkinson's often have multiple comorbidities. There's, there's polypharmacy far and above the treatments that they're on for their Parkinson's disease. And of course, there's, there's the other, other difficulties, so Parkinson's related dementia, Lewy body dementia, that sort of thing. But it's always worth making sure we, we look for signs of infection, any problems with medications that might be driving things, and any metabolic problems which might be driving things. If in the, it's, it's not common, but occasionally um, sedation is required for people that are at risk of causing harm to themselves or to others. And so lorazepam is, is probably the safest drug in terms of that. And, and start with a low dose, so half a milligram. Never give haloperidol or clochromazine because these block dopamine receptors. And then a very common thing on the medical call, of course, is, is nausea and vomiting. And um, the medications we absolutely shouldn't be given are, are things like metoclopramide that will make the people's Parkinson's very much worse. So my go-to in terms of nausea and vomiting is uh, uh, domperidone and cyclozine, and on Dan's trunk can be, can be quite good, although it's, it's not really licensed for that use, but it's a safer medication to use. I thought I'd talk briefly on falls, um, and, and the reason for that is that falls in people with Parkinson's disease is very, very common for all the reasons we've talked about. So postural instability, a slowing up, medications that cause postural hypotension, um, the side effects of the medications, deliriums, all of those things all add up to a fall, the consequence of all of those problems. And there's been a lot of studies which have looked um, at Parkinson's disease and falls. And actually about 60% of patients with Parkinson's report at least one fall in a year. About 40% will describe recurrent falls over the course of the year. And so I think it's actually quite helpful to, if someone presents to a medical oncologist when they have Parkinson's, just to think about the falls risk. So make sure people, particularly people with delirium, are managed in a bed space where they're, they're more visible, where the nurses are closer by and the doctors are closer by, if needs be, to, to, to just make sure people don't fall on the ward. With Parkinson's disease, I think it's very easy to say, uh, and very common with Parkinson's disease, for everyone to think, ah, oh, it's because of the Parkinson's. It's because people uh, are shuffling and tripping on objects. But I think it's really important that, that people who, um, who are admitted to the hospital, um, uh, seen in general practice, should have a consideration of postural hypotension because of the multiple medications, because of the very high risk of postural hypotension. But of course, people fall for all the other reasons too. Um, so cardiac abnormalities, medication problems, that sort of thing. Hallucinations, of course, much more likely to make you fall. And of course, the, 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 the shuffling gait the, um, and the postural instability that comes with Parkinson's disease. 
I'm going to talk briefly. This is this is falls more in general, but I think absolutely relates to problems with Parkinson's. And I, I was involved with some work with the Trauma Audit Research Network, who are a group based in Manchester. And what we did is we looked at falls across the country. We looked at falls in people who had sustained a, um, a what we call severe trauma, and that's from an, what they call an injury severity score of 15 or more, and that can be graded. It's not used usually in clinical practice, but that can be graded from the injuries which are found post CT and that sort of thing. So we looked at all patients who were admitted to a hospital with an injury severity score of 15 or greater, so severe trauma, and then we broke that down into age brackets. And this is what we found. And we were not looking for this in particular. And it, it was quite surprising. What we found is that major trauma in this country is now, more commonly than not, a fall of less than two meters, so from a standing height, in your front room. And that's major trauma. When you're younger, so less than 60, major trauma is all those things that we would normally expect. So car accidents, falling from rooftops, that sort of thing. We looked at, across the age brackets, where were patients presenting with major trauma? And what it shows is that if you're younger, you're much more likely to suffer major trauma um, when you're outside. And when you're older, much more likely to suffer major trauma when, on the, on, when you fall in your front room, essentially. So if you're older than 90, then an indoor accident, a fall from a standing height, um, is what's causing the major trauma. We had a look at the, the types of mechanisms that were causing um, death from major trauma. And as you can see, the bottom, the bottom line here, um, my cursor's working, um, as you get older, much more likely to have major trauma from a fall of less than two meters. When a, great, a fall greater than, uh, greater than two meters, more common in this sort of age bracket. Road traffic accident, much more common in, in younger age groups and then diminishes as, as you get older. We looked at what were the injuries that were causing the major trauma. And actually, of the people who died in, in, across the country, it was head injury. Head trauma was, was the principal um, problem. But each of these lines describes a different age bracket. And I think you'd agree that actually the trauma pattern is very similar across the different age brackets. So head injury, thoracic injury, major cause of, of, um, of, of death, abdominal injury and spinal injury. And that was similar across all of the ages. So people were falling in their front rooms and having the same injury pattern um, uh, as people who were less than 60 having what we traditionally call major trauma. The problem is that the way that we recognize it, the way we manage that is very different. And this graph shows that um, if you're younger, you're much more likely to have what we call a triage positive major trauma. So that's all the things we, we see on TV. So red phones ringing, HEMS helicopters landing, ambulances arriving, consultants all, um, all running down to the recess room to, to, to go and save the patient. As the years progress, you're much less likely to trigger a, um, a, a trauma call. Again, as you get older, you're much less likely to be managed by a senior clinician. So much more likely to see a consultant if you're less than 16 or if you're up to about 60, and then it begins to, to, to tail off. So what we found is that major trauma in this country in people who are older than 60 is falling over uh, at home at a standing height, and you have the same injuries as people that have had traditionally what we consider to be major trauma, but actually the response is very different. And that translates to how we investigate people. So the time to CT scan gradually lengthens as, as you get older. We actually found across the group we looked at the time to CT was about one and a half hours longer in older patients, but actually there, there were significant outliers around that. And I think that's for a number of reasons. I think it's because it's often harder to assess people, so people presenting with dementia and that sort of thing will present differently to people who are younger and, 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 uh, and uh, cognitively um, lucid. I think the brain has probably got a little bit more space to accommodate often um, if there's been bleeding, so people don't show the same signs until perhaps slightly later. We've already seen that more likely to be seen by a more, more junior member of staff at the initial presentation. And also, I think that this shows that there's quite poor recognition of what amounts to major trauma in older patients. And that really translates to saying that 
we know that people with Parkinson's disease are more likely to fall and they're likely to be older. And so we're not recognizing major trauma in these people. Again, you're less likely once major trauma is recognized to be transferred to somewhere um, to have, for example, burr hole surgery and, and that sort of thing as, as you get older. And we looked at whether this was, this was because of comorbidities and actually it didn't look as though it necessarily was, but there's more work to be done on that. Um, similarly, more likely to, to have a, a senior uh, a senior person, a consultant, operate on you if, if you're younger than than, uh, than than if you're older. So I hope I hope that data suggests to you, as it does to me, that that actually people who fall in their front rooms are suffering major trauma when they're elderly. It's from a standing height, and actually we need to be managing people as though they've had a significant injury when when they present to the medical on call. The other things that we, we should think about, of course, are all the other reasons. Um, so we talked a bit about Parkinson's being an independent risk factor for falls, but of course it doesn't, um, it doesn't stop the other problems, but you're more likely to have orthostatic hypotension because of the autonomic dysfunction, because of the medications, perhaps more likely to have cognitive impairment. Um, there's, there's all of the other reasons that, 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 other pe that people who don't have Parkinson's fall had as well. So sarcopenia um, uh, as you get older, home hazards, polypharmacy from other conditions aside from the Parkinson's. So I think the key points really from here um, are that um, I think typical trauma in this country has changed. I think we all need to be very much more aware of the person who's just fallen in their front room, just a fall doctor. I don't think we can see it as just a fall anymore. I think people actually have the same injury pattern as, as, um, as younger people in, in what, we, what we recognize as major trauma. There are things which can be done with people with Parkinson's in particular. So freezing um, is, can be, it can be very helpful for people to have physiotherapy and think about what we call cueing. So giving people techniques to work around freezing episodes. Of course, environmental adaption. So meeting with an occupational therapist can be really helpful. And of course, optimizing medications. Um, trying to help with things like dyskinesias as well can, can help to reduce the risk of falls. There's, there's evidence that things like Tai Chi can be very helpful. Um, giving people strategies for helping them to turn safely very helpful and of course I think it's always important just in the back of your mind to think about people's osteoporotic risk. We know people are more likely to fall, we know that major trauma is likely to ensue and so if we can keep the bones stronger then, um, then hopefully there'll be fewer fractures if we consider that early on. I'm just going to finally, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on to this case report. And this is a fairly common uh, presentation that I, I would uh, be asked to see on the medical uh, take. So this is an 86 year old lady who has some a background of mild cognitive impairment supported at home by family. Um, had a recent history of recurrent falls. So fallen a few times over the past few years, but over the last few months has fallen very much more frequently. Um, started to describe some postural symptoms. So when first stood up, felt a little bit lightheaded, tended to start walking, would often have to hold on to something. And um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease some 12 years earlier, so quite quite, quite a long time ago in, in, in terms of Parkinson's disease. And the medication had been gradually adjusted over the years by various uh, people uh, in the Parkinson's service to try and keep the bradykinesias at bay, to kind of try and keep the person as on as possible. Now, the, the person that we were treating had actually changed over that time. Um, so had now become largely housebound, tended to walk around the house with a frame, um, was um, uh, not able to get out and about as, as, as they used to do, a bit more muscle wasting or sarcopenia, and had a couple of other uh, medical problems along the way, which, which had made them a bit breathless when mobilizing. So the person over the years had, had changed from from what was being managed perhaps four or five years ago in terms of the Parkinson's disease. The, the patient actually moved areas and came, and came un, under, under the service. Um, uh, and I noted in the past history that they've been treated for ischemic heart disease and also some urinary incontinence. Um, I asked directly about hallucinations and actually this is something you do often have to ask directly because people will say oh no everything's fine but if you give people a couple of examples and say oh yeah of course I, I do I do sometimes see a, a cat sitting in the corner of the room I, I don't have a cat um, 
And talking with some of the family, they felt that the, the person had become a little bit more disorientated, still able to have a normal conversation, but a bit more disorientated over the past few years. When I examined the patient, she had some um, right-sided bra bradykinesia, um, some mild rigidity in both upper limbs. I thought mobilized quite well with the frame, but it was a bit unsteady when they first stood up. And actually I found a postural drop of 50 millimeters of mercury, so pretty significant. Good reason to fall over. Looking at the medications, well, they're on Madapar 125 milligrams five times a day, so that's a pretty reasonable dose. Rosagiline, two milligrams to try and extend the, the duration of the levodopa. They sometimes took a Madapar dispersible, 62.5 at six o'clock in the morning, just to give them a bit of a boost. They're on some Rapinarol, um, six milligrams, so a dopamine agonist. Uh, Amitriptyline, 25, big cholinergic burden. Oxybutynin to help with their bladder dysfunction. Some Clopidogrel can cause postural hypotension and some bisoprolol. So quite on quite a lot of medications, actually. A few of those could well be driving the hallucinations. A few of them could be driving some of the difficulties with cognition. I thought on quite a high cholinergic burden there. And so my feeling was this person really didn't need any more medications to try to help them. And so I spent a bit of time talking with them. And, and actually, I think over the years, many more and more medications have been advised. And the idea of reducing medications wasn't something that had really been, been talked about very much. But we agreed that what we do is we'd, we'd reduce the amitriptyline um, and actually use things like paracetamol, just simple pain, pain relief. It was, it was there for some lumbar back pain. Change the oxybutin into solifenacin. Gradually, over um, a few months, weaned the rapinarol and then stopped it. Reduced the Madapar down to four times a day and we stopped the Rosagiline, again weaned it and stopped it. And actually what I found was where the person had changed physically over the years, in terms of their overall mobility, their Parkinson's, um, their sort of on periods, there was very little deterioration by making those changes in the medications because the person had changed and actually, yes, it's right to escalate the medications for time, but actually de-escalation of medications. And thinking about the other medications that people are on, which all have a significant cholinergic burden, is really, really important. And actually, really important, um, particularly in the later years with Parkinson's. So in summary, I think that it's really important to just keep in mind all of the medications people are on. It's, not, it's often not about introducing more medications to make the situation better, particularly the patients we see on the acute medical tape with delirium and things like that. The medications do evolve over some years. It's really important to try and assess the overall picture. And I think actually having a, a, a good relationship with the patient, trying to talk through and describe the things you're trying to do, not just stopping medications, but actually engaging with the patient and describing why you're cutting back on that medication they might have been on for 10 or 15 years. And I think it's really important to always think about other aspects of, 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 um, of conditions like Parkinson's, things like falls and, and osteoporosis. So that was a a whistle stop tour of, uh, I think, some of the complexities of multi, multi morbidity and, and Parkinson's disease. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask if there's any questions. Well, thank you, Adam. That was, um, that was absolutely fascinating and I really enjoyed it. We've had quite a few questions. Um, I'd like to get through as many of them as possible because I want to know the answers to quite a few of them. Um, th there's a couple that are on the theme of, of diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease, um, which, um, which I can completely understand. Um, one of the questions is um, about the, the diagnostic criteria you use for Parkinson's um, and whether you, you use the UK Brain Bank criteria um, or whether you use one of the later diagnostic criteria and what you think of those. Yeah, I think I think the key really is to um, so there's several criteria, as you say, the I think the absolute key is that bradykinesia has to be there. And I, I try and always keep that in mind. Yeah. I think it's difficult to diagnose someone sitting in front of you with some of the other features of, of Parkinson's that, that we touched on without having bradykinesia. And so that, that's an absolute core. Um, and so, and so there are multiple ways, so ICD-10 rules, that sort of thing. But, but I think bradykinesia, and if you examine the person, they have rigidity and a, and a, and a reasonable history, then, then I think that, that that's what you need to go on. It's the person sitting in front of you. Okay. And um, just moving on, uh, on, on the question of, of, of diagnosis, one of uh, our questions was, um, and I appreciate this is 
a slightly tricky one, um, but do you have a reliable way to diagnose Lewy body disease in an elderly patient with hallucinations? Yeah, um, and that, that is, it's a lot of that is about the history. So people will present with hallucinations. Um, the, the key to that really is, is in the history in terms of when did the Parkinsonian features uh, start? And when did the, the memory difficulties start? So if, if the memory problems are later in the condition, so uh, they have, they have Parkin, Parkinson's features for over a year is, 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 is how it's described, and then the memory problems start, well, that's less likely to be a Lewy body type picture. That's more likely to be a, a Parkinson's related dementia. For me, if, if there are hallucinations early on, the memory features are much more to the fore and fluctuations in people's capabilities. So, um, so some days much better than others, some days hallucinating, almost like a delirium, and then other days much more lucid, much more likely to be a Lewy body type dementia. Certainly my experience with Lewy body dementia is that actually the Parkinsonian features are not the principal problem. They're often the thing which are referred so someone's noticed that they've slowed down. But when you talk to the person, they, they will often have significant cognitive problems and hallucinations as an early feature. So it's all in the history, really. Um, and actually, I think if, if you're thinking about uh, Lewy body dementia from the outset, well, I think, first of all, they, they should see someone very specialist in that. So think about old age psychiatry. It's about engaging the appropriate support and services around people because it's a condition which is much more aggressive, much more likely to, um, to, to progress and cause significant behavioral problems and hallucinations and all of those things. The family needs support, the patients need support. It's less about starting lots of medications to keep them mobile. It's, it's not, it's, the focus is different to, to Parkinson's, but I think it's really important to, it's the principal differential diagnosis that you see in clinic. Okay, thanks. That's, that, that's useful. Um, moving on then to um, some questions about um, management. Um, and th the next question um, really reflects what you were saying throughout a lot of your talk, which is that there's this constant tension in, in PD between what, what are the symptoms of the, the underlying condition and what are the side effects of the medications. Um, and, and, and one attendee has asked, um, what would you advise for someone who feels fatigue as a, as a main symptom of their Parkinson's disease, but finds that the, the Parkinson's medications make their daytime somnolence worse? Yeah, um, that's, that's a very difficult question. Um, and, it's, and it's one which I have to say, uh, I think can be a struggle, actually. I think that the, the difficulty there is that sometimes it's because people are undertreated. And I think you have to take a view with the person that's there in front of you. And I think particularly, again, my experience is that if people have got an underlying cognitive problem associated with it, I'm very much, I'm, I'm reluctant to escalate the doses of their medications under those circumstances and would, yeah. and would take the stance that I would cut back on the medications there. And I think sometimes it is a, it is a case of just saying, let's try something and see what happens. As a geriatrician, my go-to is to try and cut back on medications. Uh, and I think that's nearly always the right answer, particularly in the frailer and older person. Okay. Um, so um, just uh, along similar lines, we've had a question which which amused me slightly, which which says, um, how can we avoid the, the fatal error of prescribing haloperidol for psychotic symptoms to a new patient with previously undiagnosed Parkinson's who's bed bound and essentially non-communicating? And I guess the, the, the obvious answer to that question is, is, is don't give haloperidol to that patient. Um, but I just thought as a geriatrician, you might like to expand a little bit on the use of antipsychotics in the elderly. Yeah, so um, I, I think, uh, of course, I think if, if things are undiagnosed, then pe pe sorry, I've just knocked the thing. people won't know to not give the medications. I think, I think that said, I very rarely prescribe antipsychotic medications now. Um, in the, it's, it really is a case of patients who are a danger to themselves, a danger to others. That's the time that I would tend to use low doses of things like lorazepam. If there are patients who are quite clearly agitated and distressed, and it looks like it could be from an underlying dementia, then perhaps think about medications like quetiapine, that sort of thing in the longer term. I would tend to involve some of my old age psychiatry colleagues to help with that. The spiridone low doses sometimes can be helpful, but you'd want to be sure that, that you know, there, there are no other problems um, around that. 
Um, and, and so I think I think it is a very difficult field. I think, I, again, as a geriatrician, I think the fewer medications that you can prescribe, the better. And actually deliriums, things like that, nearly always better managed by de-escalating the situation. So not having lots of security guards there, um, by having the, the, the room well lit, by having distractions in the room, things, things that people can you know, hold on to or mitts that people can play with. We have these excellent, um, and I don't mean mitts which are used to, um, to uh, hold on to people's hands. They're, they're sort of mitts which people can, can play with. They've got beads in them and things like that, things which, which distract. Um, and actually that's very much more helpful than using, than using uh, uh, drugs to, to sedate people. A real focus on non-pharmacological interventions in those situations. Um, the next question is from a, um, someone who's obviously thinking very pragmatically about what they do with, with patients with PD um, uh, on the acute take. Um, and the question is, a frail patient with advanced PD is admitted in a deteriorated condition and they may have been not taking their PD medications for a few days. The differential lies between having missed their PD meds and approaching end of life care. How long would you suggest treating with retigotine patches or NG Madapar before considering that the PD meds have been adequately replaced and therefore end of life care should be considered if their condition isn't improving? Yeah, I think, um, uh, and that's, that's, that's quite a common situation in many ways. Um, I think you always have to take a view, is it something like a nasogastric tube gonna be appropriate in this person? Probably not is the answer in someone that's frail and perhaps approaching the end of life. Um, technically, of course, a lot more difficult to put in, even if you do think it's it's um, it's it's the right the right situation after discussion with with next of kin and um, and everybody. Um, I think that um, using things like retigotine patches in that situation is a very reasonable approach. Um, I would tend to start a, a you know use use the the calculator online to help with with the um, the appropriate dosing. You probably want to be giving it you know forty eight hours minimum. Um, because there's there's a good chance people could be having a hypoactive delirium as well from um, from not having the medications, and so you do need to give it a bit of time to to have its action. Uh, I'd have thought 48, 48 to seventy two hours would be would be my sort of time scale. And I think if someone were not showing signs of improvement with that, then then that may that may herald you know, signs of end of life is is, is coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to have to draw things to a, a close very shortly because we are running short on time but just one more question which I know will be close to your heart um, and um, that is that given the injury patterns seen in a fall from standing should these patients be having a CT of their whole body in the same way that um, a younger patient who's having a trauma call would have? Um, yes the, um, uh, uh, and so uh, a perfect example of that uh, a patient who had a fall recently just tripped over um, uh, came up onto the medical on call to uh, have some physiotherapy to mobilize. I thought the pain in the ribs was slightly more than I would have expected and so put them through the scanner and actually had a splenic rupture. Um, and actually we, we miss these, these diagnoses if we don't look for them. And so yes, I think falls with pain, um, which is difficult to account for with things that you can see, I think they should have a trauma sequence. Yeah, that's interesting, thank you. Um, well, look, Adam, um, it's been really very interesting hearing your talk. Um, I, I, for one, have certainly really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much to the audience for attending this evening as well. Um, we'd just like to ask you a few favours um, if you've enjoyed the webinar this evening. Um, firstly, please do tell your, your colleagues and friends about UKGIM. Secondly, um, we'd be really grateful if you could give us a, a like, share or retweet on social media. Um, and finally, get your study leave booked and head on over to UKGIM and book your tickets for the conference on the 2nd and 3rd of March 2021. Thank you very much everybody and good night.